Last week, we uncovered the true cost. The average American wedding costs over $25,000. Of what the wedding industry doesn't want you to know. What is it about the word wedding that hikes prices? It means dollar signs. We're talking to the experts that left the wedding business. Are you ready for this? That's over a quarter million. Why didn't you close that sale? What didn't you do? That are finally ready to share the stories they never told. Someone could have died for that. More accurate than, than you would want it to be. How did this day of love and celebration become a multi-billion dollar industry? As I begin to plan my big day, I want to protect my heart and my wallet. Dress, check. Flowers, check. Two million dollar price tag, check, check. Is there a way to feel the love? Without losing my mind down the aisle. Thank you to Karma for sponsoring this video. Say hello to your new soulmate. Karma is a free app and Chrome extension that ensures you never miss a price drop or a coupon code. When planning your wedding, it's easy for everything to add up fast. But with Karma, you can ensure that you're always getting the best price for all of those wedding DIYs and supplies. Whenever I'm getting ready to check out online and it asks if I have a coupon code, I know there are codes out there, but I can just never find them. Well, that's where Karma comes in. Karma will pop up on my computer screen with the best code that saves me the most money. It's like a happy surprise, especially because I forget I have the extension, making my wedding budgeting easier. All you have to do is download the Karma Chrome extension for free and then start shopping. Karma also allows you to save an item if you want to keep an eye on it to see if the price drops. And if it does, Karma will notify you. See something that's been out of stock? Karma can tell you when it's back. It's like your personal shopping assistant. Here is the list I've created for my wedding. I love that I was able to organize everything that I wanted in categories, like this pair of shoes that I definitely don't want to pay full price for. Karma is going to let me know when they go on sale. But the best part of all, when you shop from select retail partners, Karma gives cash back to you and a good cause. So if you're ready to try Karma for yourself for free, click the link down below and download the Chrome extension and fall in love with your new savings. A long time ago, in a land nobody knows, a handsome young gentleman prepares to propose with the ring in his pocket. How hard could it be? And is he truly ready to get down on one knee? He's heard all the warnings. Marriage, it's a joke. One minute you're in love, in the next you're broke. So unless he can find a genie to grant him three wishes, he'll never be able to afford to become Mr. and Mrs. We all remember the stories that ended with a happily ever after. But the thing about fairy tales is they tend to be a little unrealistic. Getting married isn't as easy as riding off into the sunset. There's months of preparation that go into planning the big day. And the multi-billion dollar wedding industry is profiting from every minute. All of this can feel overwhelming. So today, we're doing something fun. Last week, I had my dress fitting. So this week, we're going to Generation Tux, so Zach can try on a few tuxedos in hopes of finding the perfect fit. up here for okay. you. Thank you so much. Of course. I want black shirt, black pants, black suit, 
That's because you just want to stand out and you're all white. Yeah, I think so. It's just for size though, right? Definitely for size, so we know exactly what it is. Well, you definitely want to get a black jacket. Yeah. I think that one's navy, right? Yeah, it does look navy, doesn't it? It's like a dark blue. It's a dark blue, yeah. That's enough. That's She's all black, that's what she wants. It's all black. I love those pants, those are really nice. Yeah, the pants um, fit really nice. And honestly, they fit you perfectly. Like, you wouldn't want them to be tighter than that because this no. is a formal look. Why don't you try it on with the bow tie? Yeah, so when you do the bow tie, do you tie, do you button this all the way? Yes. All right, so how do you um, tighten it? Back there? Yeah. You want to just tighten it a little bit? I feel like it can go a little tighter. Like a little... <laughs> <laughs> Do you like the bow tie, Zach? Uh, I don't mind it. Would I be wearing a belt with these or no? Um, boobs. Wait, wait. What is this? <laughs> there, yeah, yeah there's like no place to put a belt. Maybe you don't put a belt on a tux. That's why the suspenders are there. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's right. Is that what the suspenders are for? Then? They hold your pants up. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't get pants. <laughs> Your yes, wedding day. Like <laughs> we said yes to the tux. Seeing Zach try on these different tuxedos honestly made me so excited for our wedding day. It was so fun coming up with different combinations and finding one that really worked. I know planning a wedding can be stressful, which is why I'm so grateful everyone at Generation Tux was so helpful and made sure we took in every moment of this experience. But I know not every step of the wedding planning process is easy, especially when it comes to buying the perfect engagement ring. Jason, an ex-jewelry salesman, has been sharing with us the stories he never told and the secrets that the engagement ring business doesn't want you to know. I love that you come from the corporate side of the wedding industry, but you understand how important it is to focus on the love, yep. not the money, right. not the sale. And most importantly, you know, the couple should feel like they're taking in every moment of this process. Yeah. It's not just about the sale. And I feel like that's definitely something that could be improved. Uh, you know, I was thinking about my time in jewelry and the way that I was able to live my life and not be focused on the commission, I feel like owners of jewelry stores and in the corporate world, they need to pay their employees better and put less focus on the commission, less focus on driving their salespeople to have to make sales in order to survive, in order to pay the bills, but actually paying them a decent wage and then making commission less. A lot of people stay away from fine jewelry stores and they go to lesser jewelry stores that are found in the mall, you know, like chain jewelry stores, because they think, oh, I can't afford jewelry at a fine jewelry store. Please don't do that. <laughs> in a fine jewelry store, I worked in one of the finest in the country. You're gonna find a gemstone, a diamond, a piece of jewelry for every budget. Every budget is there. The other thing about fine jewelry is people think it's so expensive because there's these huge markups in jewelry. Well, that's another misnomer. The more expensive something is, the more fine it is, the, the smaller the markup. There are 10 time markups in jewelry stores and malls and things like that. There are things that are their cost and then they multiply it by five or eight or 10 times and then they mark it down 40% off. Whenever you see stuff like that, yeah, you're, you're gonna get what you pay for and they're gonna get their profit. They actually have more profit margins in theirs than we did in ours. The actual, the actual fine, fine jewelry. The actual fine jewelry. So you're, you're per dollar, you're getting more. Yeah, yeah. If you choose to shop. If you shop in a fine jewelry store. If you don't mind me asking, 
what was the most expensive engagement ring you've ever sold? <laughs> Are you ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> You're sitting down, so that's good. <laughs> the most expensive engagement ring that I sold was $275,000. $275,000. That's over a quarter million. For one ring. Yeah. What did it look like? What was it? <laughs> it was a six and three quarter carat canary yellow diamond. We had it in the front showcase, you know, so as people would walk by on the street, they could see it. It was kind of one of those show pieces and people would stop in their tracks and be like, wow. And I've seen so, those yellow diamonds. So there was this couple uh, and I, I, I actually remember their names and I don't remember the names of all of my, my clients and customers. There were many, but there, I do remember their names. And they came in and they said, you know, that ring stopped them and I noticed that. And then they came in the store and said, oh, you know, we're just looking. And they I said, said, we're just looking. Yeah, yeah. Most people will say that. And so I said, well, I noticed you were just looking at that, that ring and I want to just show it to you because it's definitely not something you want to walk by and never see again because you'll want to see this. And I, and I talked about the fancy yellow diamond and I talked about the actual shape of it. It was a cushion cut diamond. It was fantastic. It literally, and I said, watch out, you're going to trip on the extension cord because this thing's plugged into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> it was that shiny. It was so incredible. It looked electric. Wow. And, you know, they looked at it and then, of course, you know, they left. They didn't buy it. And it took them coming back into the store probably half a dozen times until, you know, the sale actually was made. Well, and I think it's kind of ironic because they walked out the front door. They didn't buy it the first exactly. time they came in. No, 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 no. So no. the irony of that is, okay... You have this rule, if the customer leaves, you've yep. lost them. Right. But your biggest sale, the customer left multiple times and yep. came back. Yep. So I really think that logic has, has to go. I, I agree. It's so crazy to me that jewelry salesmen are told if a customer leaves without buying, they've lost them forever. This logic is not only controlling, but extremely manipulative in my opinion. Jewelry store owners need to know that customers are allowed to leave whenever they want, whether they bought something or not. The owner had installed cameras in a time when this was kind of brand new and could watch us from anywhere in the world. He could watch us on his phone. He could watch us from home and I would get a call multiple times after customers would walk out. Why didn't you close that sale? What didn't you do? What? I would. And I got the most pressure put on me constantly to close the sale. They walked out and you lost them forever. And I was told that many, many times. And it, it really, it was the worst part of being in that business was not letting me just be me and do what I do, despite the fact that every year I sold more than everyone else, that every year I sold, you know, over a million dollars after that first year. And it just, it was never enough. It seems to be the pattern. It's never enough. Right. Yeah. Never enough sales, yeah. never enough money. Yeah. Imagine working in such a toxic environment that your boss literally watches you on a camera monitoring your every move. And if you don't make a sale, they call you and ask why. It really makes me sympathize and understand a little bit more why the salespeople were under so much pressure. So it really took me, you know, and there are people like myself who are still in the business. Um, I wish there were more. And I think what owners can do is, again, focus more on paying their employees good wages so that they're not so focused on the commission and employee training. You know, I was promoted pretty quick and I was a sales trainer, but what I trained my colleagues and clients, you know, people that I worked with was about the process itself. 
and the gems and the jewelry and just sharing the story of how stuff is made and where it comes from and let people fall in love with it. Speaking of where it comes from, have you ever seen the movie Blood Diamond? I have. One of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> how accurate is that movie to the gem sourcing problem? Uh, I would say highly accurate, more accurate than, than you would want it to be. Um, certainly blood diamonds and blood gems, I mean it's not just diamonds, that are controlled by cartels and, and the drug industry and gangs. It's, um, it's terrible, you know, and, and a lot of these precious gems are mined and found in some of the poorest regions of the world, you know, along the equator. It's a shame, but stones come with certificates and you can ask for those certificates. And if a stone doesn't have a certificate, you don't necessarily have to assume that it comes from a, a region of conflict, but it certainly is possible. In many countries around the world, thousands of people and even sometimes children are forced against their will to mine for gemstones that will later be sold for thousands or even millions of dollars. Meanwhile, the person that found the stone itself will see none of that money and may even lose their life. We all love our engagement rings, but I think we can agree purchasing a stone is not worth a human life. A lot of people have no idea that when they purchase a diamond or a gemstone for their engagement ring, that someone could have died for that. I would say a lot of people just don't know that. And that's why they aren't asking for certificates. Like what would you say to someone that has no idea about <laughs> gem sourcing? What are the qualifications that you need to go in and, and make sure of, ask for from your jeweler to make sure you're getting something that's sourced ethically? When you're buying gemstones, and you're buying a product, whether it's a, a watch or a ring or a diamond or a sapphire, you are voting yes. You're saying, yes, I approve of everything that happened to put this into my hands. And it's not just jewelry is what I'm saying. It's everything you buy. So I think what the consumer needs to know is that every time they buy something, they're voting for that product. They're voting yes, that they believe in every part of the process. Now. All they've got to do is a little bit of digging. Go back to the source and, and do a little consumer education. The cool thing about the era now that we live in, there's certainly access to the internet and access to information. And I think, you know, consumers need to be aware. So if you're going to make a big pr purchase, if you're going to get into the engagement business yourself and get engaged, do your research. Learn about the four C's. Learn about sourcing of diamonds, do your research, and then come in and trust a professional. And if they're not professional, find another one. Get a second opinion, get a third opinion. <laughs> There's so much that goes on behind closed doors, whether it's engagement rings or any other part of the wedding planning process. What I'm realizing is it's not just difficult for the future brides and grooms of the world, but also the employees that are working behind the scenes, trying to make your perfect day happen. But there's one story that I need to share. A story so crazy, you might not believe it. Meet Angel. We met at our church and slowly became close friends. After I decided to make this series, Angel informed me that she used to be a wedding planner. And not just any wedding planner. Angel would organize the biggest, most beautiful, breathtaking celebrity weddings. Working for the stars surrounded by love, or so it seemed. On the outside, you'd think Angel was living in heaven. But everything is not as it seems and the pressure to obtain perfection would finally take its toll. I 
had a business, I had a child, I had a husband, and um, it was, I mean, it was what it is, like I had a family and it was good. Um, but that, that kind of stopped when I had a stroke. Um, so I had so the stroke um, and all of my identity stopped. I didn't know my name, I didn't know who I was, I didn't know, I had a child, I didn't know if I had a husband, I knew none of this stuff, I was completely, just kind of done. Um, I was scared, extremely scared. I wasn't really sure what I could do. Um, I didn't, honestly, there wasn't really much of anything. Um, I couldn't walk and I couldn't talk. And um, I just didn't know what to do. Um, the doctors would talk to me, um, what's your name? Who are you? You know, can you, what's the, what's the date? And I was like, I, I don't know, I had no idea. When I was done with the hospital, um, I had to go to a new part of, of my mom's house and understanding what I needed to do. Um, they tried to tell me, uh, the doctors and um, the therapist would tell me, you know, okay, can you write? Can you do any of this? And I, I couldn't. Um, I, felt, I felt stupid, honestly. There was so much shame all over me um, because I didn't know who I was. I think at one point I told my mom, um, Mom, can you tell me, can you write down um, who Jesus is? I know Jesus, uh, Holy Spirit, and God. I need to know so I can see them on my, on my life. I need to put it actually on paper so I can see it because I really couldn't. And um, I was like, okay, no problem. Um, and so little by little, I was able to, to get better, to strive, uh, what's it? Um, stride, stride. I guess the word um, and you know I was able to get a little bit more like me um, so I was able to get back here to to the desert because I was in Orange County to the desert and um, trying to get a little bit more about who I was and what I was doing and um, I asked God what what could I do Lord when I have nothing <laughs> everything was strict and so now I now at that point I was divorced I had a child who he knew more about walking and talking more than I could and I said God what exactly can I do with this now um, and you know the Lord just said to me I walk with you I talk with you I have you I cover you and, um, and I said okay well if you're with me I got it <laughs> um, so now that I have that um, I'm realizing that what would have been here, my identity is no longer there. My identity is Jesus. Um, Jesus is safe, he's good. Um, and as I walk through the little parts of my life now, um, now I can walk and now I can talk and I'm learning how to spell. Um, now I am trying to look at the, at the joy of being able to be the new me and, um, and what works over here is good and God is good, you know, yeah. Um, I have a Bible verse for this, and it says, For we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him. Now, before I couldn't write that, I couldn't, I couldn't even do that, I'm even saying it now. And this is him, this is God who does that kind of stuff, and I can't even say that. So God is good, and I'm so excited for what God, my new life of what he has for me, all of it. And that's it. Before Angel's stroke, everyone truly believed she lived a life surrounded by love. But the reality is the pressure of being the perfect wedding planner contributed to her stroke that she had in her 30s. Angel's story shows us how quickly the wedding business can turn toxic. But what I find the most beautiful of all is how Angel is now finally living a life surrounded by love. Real, true love. And if her story and our friendship has taught me anything, it's that on my wedding day, it's the love I want to focus on. And that will be our happily ever after. Thank you again to Karma for sponsoring this video. 
click the link down below to download the Karma Chrome extension for free.